Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 56. Here with me today, a very special guest, someone whose games I've been playing for about as long as I've been playing board games, uh, and has recently announced that he is starting a new studio of his own. Uh, welcome, Corey Kineska. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to be here. Awesome. I guess, as I do with most of these these podcasts, talking with someone, a designer, uh, let's start at the beginning. So how did you get into modern board games? What was what were kind of those introductory games for you? Sure. I'd probably say Settlers of Catan, like as far as the modern games go. That was the first one that I played that was, I don't know, more more of the hobby gateway type game. Mm-hmm. And that was probably in early 2000s. And then presumably you, you played uh, more and more of the, the hobby games. And at some point you apply kind of what mid 2000s for Fantasy Flight to work there? Yeah. So as, as a hobby, just for fun, I used to design card games and board games and play them with my friends. And it was just a fun little thing we did. I, I never really considered publishing any of them. But um, around 2004, 2005, I um, heard about Fantasy Flight and I started looking at their games and I bought Twilight Imperium and got it like the week it came out and it completely blew me away. I was like, whoa, this (laughs) is crazy. Um, (laughs) And uh, a little while later, I was just visiting their website and saw that they were looking to hire a game designer. And I thought, hey, I do that for fun. I could maybe turn that into a career. So I applied on their website. I didn't hear back for a couple of months and kind of had given up hope that it would actually happen. And then in the middle of the summer, I got a call and said, hey, we want to fly out here for an interview. And by that point, I had kind of completely forgotten about it. And I said, whoa, no way. (laughs) And um, flew out to Minnesota and... Uh, the rest is history, I guess. How big was Fantasy Flight at that point? So it was when I was hired, there were uh, a handful of other people hired at the same time. So it was, it was in the mid-20s when I got hired there. Yeah. Yeah. And and from what I've read, you part of the application process, they had you submit a design and that was, that turned into one of the Twilight Imperium expansions? Um, Sort of. Well, I was writing my resume and my cover letter, and I wanted to do something that would make me stand out from the the stacks of resumes I assumed they'd be getting. And uh, me and a friend of mine had made a couple of homebrew rules for Twilight Imperium. And um, I was a graphic designer by trade, so I made it look nice and everything. And um, when I was writing my resume, I said, you know, maybe I should send this along as well. Like show them that like I actually take this seriously and it's something I think I could do. And I totally could have shot myself in the foot. Like the the owner of the company, it was his game. If he yeah. saw this, he might be like, these are terrible ideas. But um, apparently he didn't think they were bad ideas. <laughs> and so I got the interview. And then um, after I'd been working at Fantasy Flight for a couple of years, we decided to do a Twilight Imperium expansion. And I begged to be the, one of the lead developers on it. And he's like, well, yeah, you obviously know this game pretty well. So um, some of the ideas that I had come up with before I even worked at the company ended up showing up in the in a real expansion to the game. What were those ideas? Or can you say? Yeah, um, the artifacts were one of them, which was the idea of victory points that were on specific planets mm-hmm. um, that people could take. And you would actually lose it if someone took it away from you because in the uh, base game of Twilight Imperium, third edition, when you got a victory point, there was no way for anybody to take it away. And so um, I thought that that was an interesting kind of um, approach where as opposed to just me trying to outrace you by getting points faster than you, I could actually directly get into conflict with you and not only set myself forward, but set you back. Mm-hmm. And it, it pushes a bit more conflict, which in, in third edition, you you can get in situations where like no one fights for like five hours. <laughs> yeah. And I found, you know, that that module and a few of the other modules in the expansions kind of push combat a bit more. 
Yeah, yeah, that was one of the ideas with that first expansion there was a lot of people wanted there to be more conflict in the game, and so he gave people options for, if your group wants more conflict, you can play with these new objective cards that push conflict and the artifacts and a few other things. Um, not everybody wanted that, but I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of people did, so um, it's good to give them the option. So you're hired for fantasy uh, by Fantasy Flight, and uh, what's the first thing? How does it work when you when you arrive there? Like, do they just kind of throw you in a project that they're on? So when I started at Fantasy Flight, they were in the very late development of the World of Warcraft board game, and so Christian, the, the owner of the company, the creator Twilight Imperium, he was kind of the lead on it. There were a couple of other developers, designers working on it, um, and I was thrown into the mix and I was helping play test and they said, Hey, we need to design more bosses. And so I designed a couple of bosses and I was testing those and I was designing some equipment and skills and stuff like that. So my first project was designing content for the world of Warcraft board game. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what became kind of your first design that you pursued from the beginning? Um, it's a bit tricky because like everything at fantasy flight is so collaborative. And so I think Starcraft, the board game is probably the first one where I was credited as like the designer of it, but like not all of those mechanics came from me. Some of them came from Christian or other people who were playing, working on it with me. But that was my first, I think, from scratch, like yeah. not based on a previous edition of a game, just like uh, from whole cloth new game. And I'm actually curious about how that works within Fantasy Flight, because in the board gaming world, if you if you kind of draw a parallel to like film, right, you have a lot of independent artists, right? You have a designer comes up with a game, they pitch it to a publisher, or maybe a publisher's like, hey, we got this license. Can you, you know, contact a designer? Can you build a game for this? Fantasy Flight seems very much like a studio situation where everyone kind of pitches in to help with aspects of everything. So, so ideas of like individual authorship are, are a bit more muddy. Is that accurate? Um, sometimes, I mean, the, the company has grown a lot since I first started there. And so back in the day, you would wear a lot more hats. Like when I was working on Starcraft, I was also like talking to the sculptors and the artists and <laughs> that sort of stuff. And now we've got art teams and sculpting teams and all that sort of stuff. And so, I mean, there's a lot of collaboration, but I think one thing that they did try to do at Fantasy Flight is to make sure that there was always a lead on the project, and that's the person who would get the final say. And um, I think it's important on a creative endeavor for there to be like someone who's making the creative decisions, the the person who's kind of trying to guide what the voice is of this game. You can't you can't design games by committee. Like if you do that, everything's going to be bland, and it's not really going to have any personality. And so a lot of games that I worked on at Fantasy Flight were collaborations. Um, and the ones that weren't collaborations where I was the lead designer, I still had the support of producers and playtesters and all those sort. Moving on a bit, uh, one of my favorite early games of yours, actually one of the first modern board games that I ever bought, uh, Battlestar Galactica, uh, which has now become this kind of rare treasure because uh, it's it's not getting any more printings. I think Fantasy Flight lost the license or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is is still a marvelous design, and I I, I was sad when I heard that it was it wasn't really going to get any more reprintings. What was the approach? Was it a situation where they're like, okay, we got a license or a commission or something to make a Battlestar Galactica game go, or what, were there ideas already in place? Um, so that particular one, um, my boss at the time, Christian, he approached me and said, hey, we got the Battlestar Galactica license. And I was like, that's awesome. I love the show. Uh, I'm a big sci-fi guy, but that mm -hmm. show in particular was, I don't know, it was a cultural phenomenon at the time. And so I was super excited about it. And so we sat down and we had uh, a meeting and 
I want to say it was like on an airplane where we're flying out to meet somebody about a different project. And so we're sitting next to each other on a plane for two hours and we're just talking about Battlestar Galactica and what a Battlestar Galactica game should be and what people would expect and what could make it really stand out. And that's where we sat down all the like the big tenets of what this game is, which is like, yeah, you, you definitely need there to be a traitor mechanic where somebody could be a Cylon working against you. And there's probably a way where you might not even know that you're a Cylon because that's also a big theme in the show. Um, but you might find out later that you're actually working against the humans. And so a lot of that, those early decisions all happen kind of in that two hour block where we're just talking about the show and, and what we really wanted to see out of it, what we wanted to feel like. And we then, didn't really have any mechanics at the time, but it was, it was just kind of telling the story of what, what the game would feel like. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, later on kind of fill in the gaps there, but I mean, you know, fundamentally it's, it's about that trader thing uh, mm -hmm. was the idea to have the, the mid game, uh, I can't remember the precise how you sleeper phase. It. The mid game trader switch potential was that was that there from the beginning? Yeah, I think that was in one of the early conversations. The idea that you could be a sleeper agent, um, and so kind of after I left that meeting, I, I went back and, and just started coming up with ideas of, well, what sort of mechanics do you need in a trader game? How you want there to be ways that the the person who's working against everyone can um, influence the game without being too overt. But we also want there to be kind of a trail of breadcrumbs where people can, if they're paying attention, they can have suspicions about who it may be. Um, and so it was all about kind of giving enough information without too much information. So it's kind of walking that tightrope of mm -hmm. making, making both sides feel interesting and fun and, and, have that tension yeah and in in their different you know we have a lot more traitor style uh team games out now and there's i always find it's interesting where those games go in terms of hard and soft information so so like information that's definite versus information that just happens via you know re trying to read other players mm -hmm. and in, in battlestar you have kind of the hard information of like you can tell, you know, if there are three cards that are specifically against whatever your your crisis is, you know that someone had to throw that. It couldn't. They couldn't all come from the uh, the destiny deck. Mm -hmm. uh, but I found in my games, you know, people make that mistake and then they get found out. And I find that they kind of never do that again. In 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 my group, we found that hardly anyone risks that and they try to manipulate the game in much subtler psychological ways. Is mm -hmm. that something you guys discovered during the design process or the, the play testing process of that game? Sure. I think one of the big things that we added during play testing was the idea of the destiny deck, because the, as soon as you play once and you see like someone throw in a card, that is that makes a skill check fail suddenly everyone's like well we know somebody with red cards just play the cards so it's one of these two people and so we're like okay how can we obscure it a little bit and so then we came up with the idea of the destiny deck where there's two of each color card shuffled into there and you get two random ones each skill check and so if just one card shows up you're like well it was probably one of the random cards if two show up you're like well, it could have been the random cards, but as soon as you get to that three point, then you know. And yeah. so it's all about kind of as the trader deciding like how much you're willing to risk, because even throwing in one card, there's a chance that two cards could come out of the destiny deck and, and reveal you. But if they're different colors, it could actually confuse people and someone else could get thrown in the brig. Like it's, I feel like a lot of times people will make logical leaps that aren't necessarily founded and that's that's where a lot of the fun comes out of the game in my opinion yeah yeah and then you get situations where people are so scared you know groups get a meta right that they're, they're so scared to reveal any, any information that someone i've read stories where people make everyone a cylon uh, yeah just to see what happens and like three quarters of the, of the game works perfectly fine <laughs> because everyone's so scared to to show their hand that they just kind of go along helping the human side, you know, minimally. 
Uh huh. Yeah. It's, it, it, of course, it, breaks down at some point, but <laughs> yeah, the psychology of that game is really fascinating, and that's why I think that it's really resonated with people even this many years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Moving on, in terms of at least the games of years that I've played, we jump ahead to uh, Descent uh, Second Edition, which, as I understand, I never played the first edition, but as I understand it, kind of streamlined that a bit in terms of the campaign. How was that kind of taking on a sequel of sorts? So, I mean, it's very heavily based on Kevin Wilson's uh, first edition of Descent. Mm -hmm. um, and Descent First Edition was a very successful game. And when Kevin made the Road to Legend, which was its campaign expansion, the game kind of blew up and um, became a, a really big hit for us. And so by the time we got to um, wanting to do a second edition, we said, you know, there was a campaign that was added on afterwards. If we were able to make a campaign from the very beginning, it could be more integrated into the experience. And also, um, we had a lot of other developers who had some like fresh ideas or like, okay, well, what if we wanted to take Descent and kind of um, make it a little bit more approachable, but keep all the kind of core mechanics to it. And so it was, it's always interesting working on a second edition because you have to decide how much of the first edition to keep, how much of it to change. Um, but I feel like I feel like we we got the right balance with second edition, um, and and it, it did I think it was received very well. Mm -hmm. And that's something that Fantasy Flight in particular is kind of known for is is, is a lot of iteration, you know, second editions, third editions, but also you know expansions and in, in uh, new characters and such for Descent. What's your what's your method, or do you guys kind of tap into the community? to find out what people are looking for. Cause it seems going back to Battlestar that uh, the expansions kind of specifically focus on things that people uh, may not have liked so much in the original game. You get things to soften the, um, the sympathizer, I believe the sympathizer sure. rule mm -hmm. in the base game, you get something to change the cadence of the way the ships, the enemy ships come out. Mm -hmm. um, what do you guys do to, to help that iteration in terms of community involvement. A lot of that stuff just comes out from hindsight, right? You're working on a game for, I don't know, six months to a year, depending upon the size of the game. And the game comes out and people are playing it for a year. And suddenly you go from having, I don't know, a small pool of play testers to thousands of people playing your game. Mm -hmm. um, but also you're able to kind of, I don't know. Uh, I'm always very critical of my games after they come out. And I think, oh, I've been when you're working on it, you're working on it every day of the week. But when you step away from the game for six months and then come back and play it again, you're like, oh, yeah, this particular mechanic isn't quite as good as it could be or it's too luck dependent or or perhaps people complained about it online. Um, and so. We, we sometimes, or at FFG, we would sometimes integrate those things into expansions. I wouldn't really ever look into how other people solve this or, or what other people's suggestions were for it in the community. I would mostly just see, hey, yeah, a lot of people are complaining about this. How would I solve it? And then I would just kind of get to work and see if it was viable or, or worth it. And sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's just um, different people's subjective opinions about it. And uh, and we end up just saying, you know what? It's better the way it is right now. We'll just leave it alone. <laughs> so I think a lot of... Getting, getting an understanding, you know, of what people are talking about. Yeah, and, and investigating it, seeing if it has any validity. But a lot of a lot of the expansions that we did for board games were based upon, like, the content-driven board games. I mean, something like Elder Horror, where it's like, hey, here's a game that's all about like telling a story, and we have lots of different characters that are in this universe and things that we want to show. And so that's that's most of what the expansions are. It's like, here's more content, because people just want variety more than they want the game changed drastically. Sure, yeah. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the expansions or extra content for games, how much do... Is that something, if you're like the primary designer on that game, is that something you keep, you, you stay in charge of all the way through? I mean, it varies, but my personal opinion on it is I always like when I design something 
to be the one to uh, be very hands-on for the first expansion because I feel like a game that has multiple expansions, the first one kind of sets the tone of what we can expect from expansions. And so if I, as a designer, get to work on the first expansion, I can say, okay, here's the sorts of things that I want to see in an expansion. Here's how much I want it to be new mechanics versus just more content. And I usually lean towards the more content side of things as opposed to, uh, I don't personally like expansions that add a lot more complexity. And so, yeah, I would, I would usually uh, try to be the one to work on the first one and then collaborating with whoever might be the person to work on future ones. Mm-hmm. Or, or at least, at least it would set a precedence that if someone else did take over the game line, they would be like, okay, here's about the sort of stuff that we'd put in a box and they would follow that pattern for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Now we get to the first of your star Wars games. And as someone who kind of started designing games, applied to fantasy flight, got the job working on this for a few years, uh, you get the opportunity to design a star Wars game. That's got to feel pretty special. Sure. Yeah. You've worked worked with (laughs) IPs before, but star Wars is kind of its own level. Uh huh. I always um, said Star Wars is the holy grail of IPs to work on. It's, uh, I mean, it was one of my favorite properties growing up. Like, I just absolutely love Star Wars. And to be able to work on anything related to that was just, yeah, it was a dream come true, really. X Wing was the first one of the Star Wars games you worked on? Uh, I mean, I was involved in it. That was designed by Jay Little. And um, after he kind of designed the core system and a lot of the content. Then a handful of us got on board and designed more content and more ships and more pilots and did a lot of the play testing and stuff. So that was mostly what I was involved in. Okay. What's the first star Wars one that you kind of, that you lead? That's, that's a bit tricky too, because I think, I think technically it's Imperial assault. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say that Imperial Assault is just a Star Wars version of Descent, which is um, a game designed by Kevin Wilson. So, sure. um, But that was the first one where I was the lead insofar as I had a big team of people working under me and I was kind of um, steering the direction of where the game was going and we had different people working on different aspects of it. What was kind of the goal when you're when you're taking something and adapting it to Star Wars, is there a particular approach to that in terms of how much you want to retain of the original system, um, or you kind of just say, okay, we have this as a baseline, let's add Star Wars stuff to it? Yeah, it, it's a little bit different than a new edition of a game because we, uh, I'm personally not worried about like retaining the people who liked the previous edition. I'm more worried about what are fans of this IP going to want. So how can we make it feel like Star Wars? And so you want to have the characters, you want to have the themes, you want to have the story, all those sorts of um, aspects and making sure that like that all comes through. And if we need to sacrifice a mechanic to make that work, then like we're definitely sacrifice a mechanic or change a mechanic or invent something new. There's really no sacred cows um, when it comes to that. So I think the, the biggest challenge of designing Imperial Assault is that there are like so many different games in there. There's the campaign game where you've got up to four rebel players playing against one Imperial player. But then there's also the skirmish mode which was like a head-to-head game, two players, you build an army, you show up. And so we had different people kind of working on those different parts of the game. And then we would come together once a week (laughs) and make sure that we weren't like breaking something that somebody else was working on. And then we later added the fully cooperative version, which requires the, uh, the digital app. And so there's actually like three different ways to play that game and they all need to use the same components. It was quite challenging to, to get all that to work. Yeah, and and if I remember correctly, the app was introduced a bit later after yeah. the, the release of the game. Was everything planned with the app in mind, or was that added no. on? In, no, the, right the app was something that we had um, invented for Descent 2nd Edition. After Descent 2nd Edition was oh, out right. for a yeah, while, yeah. we had like some small print-on-demand cooperative scenarios that we made for Descent. And then um, someone had the idea of, well if we could turn this into an app, 
like it would be so much more robust and it'd be awesome. And then we spent like at least a year, probably multiple years working on that. And then after we made the one for descent, we're like, well, obvious pe- obviously people are going to want this for an imperial assault too. And so we kind of learned all the lessons we had learned with the descent app and we translated those to the imperial assault one. So it was all just kind of <laughs> not planned, but I think it all came together well. It all came together in the end. Yeah. I haven't I haven't actually played with the app yet. I, I keep meaning to. What was your involvement in that and what are kind of the challenges when designing an AI of sorts? So with the Imperial Assault app, at the time I was the um lead game designer at FFG and so my involvement was mostly just playing it with the team and providing feedback. And that was kind of one of my responsibilities with every game that FFG would put out would be to play the games with the designers, provide feedback, um, and if there were any issues, to, to bring those up. Um, so with the Imperial Assault app, they had a strong backbone. They had the Descent one that they were building off of. And so they the team just kind of ran with it, and we played off and on, and I would kind of give them little suggestions. But for the most part, like, they knew what they were doing. They did a great job, and I was really happy with how it came out. The next Star Wars game to come out, uh, which I believe you're listed as the solo designer on, is, is Star Wars Rebellion, a um, mm-hmm. two-player game. And I suppose my question there is, uh, Rebellion's an interesting game to me because there are a lot of stuff in there, and maybe it's just my ignorance of, of, of board game history coming <laughs> through, but there's a, there's a number of me- mechanisms in there that feel new. In particular, the the kind of two way racetrack where the rebels are trying to get this timer to run out, but they can reduce the the threshold for that uh, by completing objectives, and then the whole the, the system in terms of sending out characters to do specific tasks is that something that you got from you know with any kind of game design you're borrowing from games you played was that something that you feel are, are super original or it, was it something that I just haven't played on that, that inspired it? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, so rebellion, the idea for that um, came from Christian who loved the old um, Star Wars rebellion video game. Oh yeah. And I remember that. Yeah. Back in the day I tried to play that game, but I think I was too young or I didn't have the instruction manual. It was just like beyond me. I couldn't figure it out. So I tried Back to play one. Back in the days when video down. games actually used instruction manuals. Right, right. I was like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what's going on. So he, he really loved it. And I know one of the big aspects of that game was like sending out characters on missions to do things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was kind of one of the things that stuck with me. And he suggest, Chris suggested the idea that um, the game uses an activation system similar to Twilight Imperium, where um, you place an activation token in the system, and, and people can move there, and then everybody's locked down there. But instead of using um, just generic tokens, those were actually characters that you were doing that with. And so I kind of took that idea, and I merged that with the idea that you could also send people out on missions to accomplish things. And it went through a lot of different iterations. Like, there was a time when early on in development, you would send somebody out on a mission, and the mission would have, like, an amount of time that it would take to accomplish. And so you'd put, like, three tokens on it, which meant that it would take three full rounds before, like, this mission would actually get accomplished. And so if you sent Lando out to do this, he would just sit there for three rounds doing nothing until you finally got to flip over this card and he did his thing. Um, (laughs) And it was just too slow. It it was kind of cool. The idea that like they were off doing something somewhere in the galaxy, but, um, but at some point during development, we we really switched around. We changed the way that like skills work and how you, um, how the phase structure was planned out where um, you first had, a time when you could send people on missions and then you had the activation phase where you could actually use them for secondary things or you could flip over cards. And that's kind of when the game really came together, when we kind of figured out what felt natural and fast and fun. And so I I don't know if I can think of another game that uses that particular system, but I mean, there's thousands and thousands of games out there. (laughs) So someone probably has. Sure. And then my memory of the, of the actual rebellion video game is fuzzy, but uh, the idea of creating a game that's just kind of hide and seek, 
Uh, was that there from the very beginning? Uh, no, that was there from the very beginning. Um, it was, to my recollection, it was inspired from the video game where the rebels had a secret base and if the empire could find it um, and take it over, they win. I'm not a hundred percent sure if that's how the video game works, but that's, that's my recollection of it. Yeah. Um, and um, I personally like, I always like the idea of asymmetric games, um, but I want my asymmetric games to have like a core foundation of rules that like everybody is using. And the asymmetry comes from kind of the play patterns that emerge where like both players are trying to do a different thing. And so it's most of the game is symmetrical. You, you do missions the same way. You activate systems the same way. You build stuff the same way. But the asymmetry really comes down to what your objective is and the cards that you get. And so mm -hmm. As soon as those two things are thrown into the mix, your, I mean, your experience is very different when you're playing. Like what you're trying to do, the that's another one that I feel like really resonated with people because of the emotions that you feel when you play it. As a rebel player, the whole time you're thinking, "Oh my god, I hope that they don't find me." Like a star destroyer flies right past your planet, and you're like breathing a sigh of relief without showing it to your opponent because you don't want them to know. Um, mm -hmm. So you're kind of playing this game of poker. And at the same time, the Imperial player, like they've been sending out probes, they might actually have some information that the rebels don't have. And so the rebels might be bluffing that their base is on Tatooine when the empire knows they're not on Tatooine because they sent a probe over there. And so just the ability to kind of get in your opponent's head and mess with them is uh, really um, what's fascinating to me about that game and what makes it a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's also a game, I mean, maybe more than any of the games I'm seeing here, the ones you've worked on, where there's a lot of game in understanding what's possible. So as you play, you kind of understand, you know, the basic cards uh, that people have, but also just the deck of cards, the possibilities that they might pull out something because there's that layer of bluffing of, okay, they're sending this particular person or they're, they're, they're issuing out this particular person, which is different from what they usually do. What kind of card could they possibly be using that person on um, that mind game? Was that something intentional to kind of add that? Kind of um, a lot of a lot of depth there in terms of, of card knowledge. I feel like that's something where it depends upon what type of player you are. Like people who want that sort of meaty experience and that level of strategy, like it's there for them. But mm -hmm. for the people who like just want to play the game and not have to memorize every card and know every trick that's up your opponent's sleeve. They can have, they can play the game. They have a very different experience. They have an experience where they're surprised and always on the edge of their seat. Um, and so it's, it's definitely a game that rewards you the more you keep playing it. But, but those early games I think are fun for a very different reason in that you're just kind of like shocked and blown away by like all this like crazy stuff that your opponent's pulling out. Yeah. It's the story of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember the first time someone converted, I think it was like Leia to the dark side. Like, <laughs> you can't, can't let that happen. What? This is wrong. <laughs> it, was, it was very dramatic. It is. It says here you worked on Star Wars Destiny with Lucas mm -hmm. Litzinger. Yep. Uh, Lucas had worked on a lot of games for us. Um, most notably uh, the uh, Android version of Netrunner. Yes. Um, yeah, rest in peace. Yeah. And so, I mean, he, he's a great card game designer and, and board game designer, too. And he was working on this game. And um, I came in at some point. I'm personally a uh, huge fan of the old Star Wars board game. I mean, Star Wars CCG, the Decipher one. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't played it in years. Who knows if it holds up? But it's got a soft place in my heart where, like, I used to play that a ton growing up. And so... Um, when I was given the opportunity to help out on a Star Wars card game, I was like, oh, this is awesome. And it came with the idea that we wanted this game to be very different than the other Star Wars card games that were out there. We had um, been developing this technology to do full color printing on dice. Um, and we knew that historically it was very challenging to make a card game with dice in it. There, there have been a fair number of them through the years. and it seems like all of them are kind of um, complained about 
by card gamers. Card gamers were like, oh, I don't want the randomness of dice. And so um, our main focus was to overcome that hurdle and to make it fun and to make the dice actually like feel um, integral to the game. And so uh, I remember one of Lucas's big inventions for that was the idea that at any time you can discard a card from your hand and re-roll any number of your dice. And so like the fact that there was always this like way to mitigate your dice rolls really helped bring the game together and make it feel like it was a game of uh, not just luck, but of strategy and how you built it together. Um, but yeah, I know I'm really, really proud of that game. I, I think it's, if you asked me to play one of my games with you, like that would be one of the ones that I would pick. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just enjoy playing it. Is there a different feeling when you're creating or, or working on a collectible game because uh, the people who, you know, you know your audience, if they get into it, is really going to get into it? Yes and no. I mean, we, we did have a lot of extra things that we had to think about. Like up until that point, I never had to worry about rarity in a game. Yeah. Um, and so it, it does make you think about some different things. But I think it was always important to us that it didn't matter how deeply you bought into this game you should always be able to have fun with it and so it was just kind of walking that fine line of we want we want people to like the people that really get into it to feel like they can buy a case of this game and get a lot of cool and interesting stuff but we also want the person who just walks in and buys a pack to get something cool and so um yeah it it was it was different to work on um but i think i learned a lot the final Star Wars game that you've worked on is the uh, newest one, Star Wars Outer Rim. I actually have I don't know a whole lot about this one. Tell me about Outer Rim. So we'd always joked about um, if we ever got the Star Wars license, we'd make the Han Solo game. Um, <laughs> the idea that you could be Han Solo and fly around the galaxy in your own ship and get a crew and this sort of stuff. And it was it was something that we hadn't really planned to do it was just i remember the uh head of our graphic design department at the time was like a huge star wars fan he used to work at west end back when they did jrpg and like that was the thing that we would always joke about the han solo game and then um at one point i i talked to my boss and i said hey i really think that this is a potential game that we should do there hasn't been a Star Wars game that has let you kind of be the scum and villainy of the galaxy, um, the rogues and scoundrels, like all of our other games, they focus on like the rebels and the empire and the Jedi and all those sorts of things. But let's, there, there's so much more to Star Wars than that. And I used to love playing the old flight Sims, um, like privateer and like, Uh, tie fighter and those sorts of things and Mm -hmm. so that was kind of a big inspiration for this game um so ultimately the game is your your scoundrel or bounty hunter or smuggler you own a ship and it's kind of up to you to make a name for yourself in the galaxy and so if you want to try to smuggle illegal goods and like become famous by doing that sure you could try that you want to like take all these illicit jobs um and get involved with the huts like sure you can do that if you want to just hunt bounties on people you can do that and so it's a very um sandbox style game where different characters are going to be better at different sorts of things but it's up to you to kind of decide who you want to be and how you want to act in the galaxy one of my favorite aspects of it is um you've got four reputation tracks you've got the empire the rebels the huts and the uh crime syndicates and for all four of those you can you have a reputation um marker with it which is on this console in front of you and that faction can either like you hate you or not care about you and every action that you take in the galaxy can move this slider around and so let's say that you decide to you find a a um, abandoned ship that has a bunch of um, stolen goods on it from the huts like you can decide to take it but if you do that now the huts don't like you and if the huts don't like you then later on events can happen where i don't know they could send some thugs after you or somebody else could even get a bounty on your head and so 
Um, it's it's very much a game about telling a story in the Star Wars universe in kind of that gray, unlawful space. And is the the goal in that game to like a certain amount of money acquired or a certain <laughs> reputation or something? Yeah, you're trying to um, get fame or infamy, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's and you get that by doing kind of great deeds, whether they are like, hey, I collected this bounty on Chewbacca, like that's going to give you a bunch of fame, or I'm the best smuggler in the galaxy, that'll give you some fame. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can try to become famous. Very nice. Looking back on the the Star Wars games that you've worked on, is is are there any, any things in particular that stand out that you're really proud of? I mean, honestly, I just feel um, I feel very honored to have been given the opportunity to work on so many of them. Um, like, I really love the um, I love the universe, I, and there's a lot of variety in them. Um, and yeah, no, I just feel fortunate. Yeah, that's awesome. Before uh, talking about uh, what you're doing in the future, I want to touch briefly on Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. Uh, sure. I remember watching the uh, the Shut Up and Sit Down documentary, which is really yeah. cool about the making of that. And uh, there's the impression from that documentary that it was like everyone kind of understood that, okay, this is kind of a really big deal that we're, that we're doing another edition and you guys wanted to make sure you got it right. Did, did, did it feel like there was more pressure on that game? Oh, yeah. There was a monumental amount of pressure on that game. I mean, Twilight Imperium is the first game that Fantasy Flight ever put out. Mm -hmm. And it was designed by the owner of the company. And so, like, and the third edition was received very well. And oh, so yeah. it's like, well, why even do a fourth edition? But, I mean, I was involved in both of the expansions to third edition i answered the rules questions to that game for pro for close to a decade <laughs> of just every time people would have a rules question it would get sent to my e email inbox and so like i worked on the faq and all those sorts of things so i kind of got to know that game inside and out and i got to see i don't know the things that we could do better and we had learned a lot in the 12 years since the third edition had come out and so i think we all just kind of knew like it was time it was time to modernize it to like update the plastic and the rules and but to make sure that we kept the heart of third edition because like the core mechanics of third edition still hold up very well oh yeah um and so the the lead developer on that game was uh dane and he uh, surprisingly has played more twilight imperium than i had <laughs> like he's crazy fanatical about that game and so so he was he was the lead developer on the game and my job was mostly at an advisory job where i kind of had a good sense of the the things that christian would want or wouldn't want to see happen in this game and we would meet with him occasionally but he was far less accessible and so Dane and I would meet, I don't know, every week or a couple of weeks or every time something would come up and we'd talk about different things. And early on, we had kind of landed on a list of things that we wanted to um, make sure the fourth edition did. And we gave a presentation to Christian and kind of talked through all those points. And I designed a couple of the new mechanics. Like I know one thing that all of us wanted to see improved in third edition was how... Um, the trade system worked oh, um, yeah, yeah. trade goods in third edition. They're really powerful, but the way that like players got trade goods, you're just kind of give somebody a trade agreement and then forget about it for the rest of the game. And so we wanted it to be more interactive. Um, and so I came up with the idea that every faction had these commodities that were worth nothing to you, but you could give them to somebody else and they would become trade goods. And then Dane came up with the idea of like, um, who your neighbors with matters and it gave you incentive to kind of move ships to somebody else's border so you can trade with them. Yes, please mm -hmm. ignore this war fleet on your border. It's there so I could trade with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, um, yeah, I mean, Dane did an amazing job on that game and really, I think, found 
the heart of TI3 and like carved it to a fine point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of the changes, what I found most compelling was the the trade, uh, as you mentioned, and also just kind of streamlining and making the uh, the tech tree easier to understand. Yep. Yeah, I remember that was um, one of the complaints that some people had about their edition. It was honestly a contentious change when we were working on fourth edition. Like some people wanted to leave the trade system alone. Um, there was a block of us who wanted to change it. And so so we tried changing it and it turned out to be really fun and everyone liked it. So we stuck with it. Yeah, I remember in my, my copy of third edition, I'd printed out a whole bunch of extra uh, pages of the tech tree sure uh, because people were like man people were taking too long to kind of think over their their technology advances but i'd hand it to them and they look at it and their eyes would kind of glaze over and they're like this doesn't make any more sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was very very old school tech tree oh yeah um, yeah now it's now it's easy uh fourth edition it's all it's all integrated into the graphic design as well yeah that was that was one of the other big additions that i was pushing for is all the technologies in um third edition i felt like they would slow down combat which was the slowest part of the game because you had to like calculate okay this thing gives me a plus one and this one gives me a minus one and this thing gives me a reroll. And so I concepted this idea of what if you could just look at your faction sheet and you would know what your to hit numbers were, you would know what your stats were for your ships without having to do any math. And so that's kind of what I mocked up. And then Dane refined the idea into what it is today. Very nice. And I also appreciate uh, nerfing the Asaro a bit. <laughs> <laughs> they were very strong. <laughs> Uh, yes, I think I think everyone probably has their own rankings of um, of what the different races are in the different editions, but um, <laughs> they were strong. <laughs> oh man, yeah. And then uh, we had we had certain races. I know in, in in third edition, fourth edition, it's no one's gotten too mad at any of them, but a couple of them in third edition would just annoy people too much. It's like, no, we're never playing with this again. <laughs> But I mean, you know, that's the kind of things that Twilight, Twilight Imperium inspires is is the uh, uh, becoming kind of involved in the dis the, the decision making of actually setting up the game it seems to be sure. kind of like a weird but key point of Twilight Imperium. Yeah, yeah, a bad setup could really um, mess up your game. So that's why we've got a preset map in TI four. Yeah, yeah. But you don't want to mess that up on your first game, so we won't let you. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So, because it's it's something you don't see a lot in games. You know, fourth edition, right? You you kind of condensed everything into the the key aspects. But I remember in third edition, like especially once you have the expansions. But even in the base game, there were modules, right? You can mm -hmm. pick and choose from, yep. and, and there's lots of discussion around that. I remember with my group of what modules we wanted to play with. Did we want to? Put it, set up the map a certain way and you know, what happens when we have five players <laughs> and it's it's a really i don't know i i really enjoy that aspect of the game uh even though it's kind of extra game work some people might put it but it to me it's 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 really interesting it's it's almost a diy thing yeah yeah i mean i feel like that's something that evolved throughout the kind of history of the company we used to do a lot more of that a la carte style expansions, but it's something that uh, FFG kind of moved away from in recent sure. years for mostly for the accessibility. Um, but there are plenty of other reasons too. It's, it's, I mean, there's, there's no objectively right way to do it. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, the accessibility is key, right? Because y you need someone bought in to make that work or else it's just too much choice, right? For, for if you don't have, a, a mega nerd who's who's researching into everything <laughs> right in your game group it becomes too much we need mega nerds they're our core audience i'm a mega nerd come on oh i am too yeah no I, <laughs> i'm not criticizing i'm just saying some groups don't necessarily have them <laughs> sure sure let's look at the future now so uh, a few weeks ago you announced that uh you were starting a new kind of branch off studio still under asthma day north america mm-hmm called unexpected games what can you share about that so yeah ultimately i i wanted an opportunity to 
really make games that can stand out and 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 try to do different things. And I feel like um, by having a studio that focuses on that, it's not ever fighting for um, the attention of other responsibilities of the studio. Like if I had, <clears throat> if I was trying to do this as part of a different studio, there would always be other distractions, other things like, oh, well, but there's this big game that we're also working on. And so that's that's the main driver here is that I feel like uh, the number I've read is that last year, 4,000 games came out. Yeah. 4,000 board games. There's no way that anybody can possibly play all of those games. And so it seems like, well, the then we just should stop making games then. There's too many. But no, I mean, there's <laughs> uh, to me, what I want out of new games is games that are different than those hundreds of games I already have on my shelf. Games that are going to... Um, approach things differently either with different themes or different mechanics or, or things that I hadn't even thought of before. And I mean, I've worked on a lot of games, um, through my career at FFG, I worked on a bunch of dungeon crawls, a bunch of, um, war games, kind of dudes on the map, map style games. Um, and I feel like there's only so many of those style games that I can do. Um, but, over the years, I've kind of collected just a lot of out there kind of different ideas. Um, and this is kind of my opportunity to try to explore them and to see um, and to, to try to do a lot of a lot of just mocking up new ideas, turning them into prototypes really fast, playing them with a bunch of people, seeing if they work, throwing them away, trying something else. Um, and so very iterative, very um open to um trying out new things quickly mm -hmm. and so is that something that you kind of that you've been given explicit license to do because anytime you anytime you're trying to do something new and, and, and innovative and, and different right you have to have a license to fail over and over and over again. That, <laughs> sure yeah right is that something that they're like okay go ahead do it um i mean so i still so i'm the head of the studio and um but any game that I want to put out, I need the backing of um, my boss, so Steve Horvath, who's in charge of Asmodee North America. Okay. He's in charge of the whole publishing division. And he approves every studio's schedule, whether it's Plat Hat or Fantasy Flight or now my studio, Unexpected Games. And so I just need to convince him that this is worth doing. And so... Um, I've already kind of played my first game with him that I've proposed that I want to do and he's on board and, and we're um, just kind of head down now, grinding away, trying to, uh, trying to get the game to be playable and fun and achieve all these goals that I've set for it. It'll come out. My first game will come out sometime next year, okay. probably second half of the year. Um, we'll have a more definitive date when we get closer to that and when we announce it. But at the moment, I'm spending 90% of my time work on that and kind of 10% of my time doing little experimental things and refining some of these um, other crazy ideas I've had so that I can find out what the next project is we should work on. Do you have a team specifically for Unexpected Games that's working with you on that? Or is it mostly is it pretty much just you right now? And so right now it's just me and I'm hiring freelancers to help out on everything else. Gotcha. And so I've got artists and graphic designers and whatnot that I've hired to work with me um, just on a freelance basis because I, I'm not big enough to need full-time staff. Eventually, maybe I will be, but um, mm -hmm. at the moment I don't have any products, so I'm not making any revenue. Um, <laughs> and so who, know, who knows what will happen in the future, but at the moment um, it's just me. And I, of course, have the support of all of Asmodee North America. So, like, they're, they've got their production team and their sales team and all those sorts of things that, like, a lot of other smaller studios have to worry about. I don't have to worry about because um, we've got dedicated teams to that sort of stuff. Yeah, and I, and I assume all the kind of the technological stuff that, that uh, you've worked with before, like you talked about the dice printing, you've got the, the unique games system, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I know a few years ago when I was playing Netrunner that 
uh, they announced they had a way to kind of print cards in house easier and, and more cost effectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so I mean, all of those technologies are things that um, that our production team has access to, and so I mean, part of the hope is to also keep pushing the envelope too, and to like have them like develop new technologies so that we can do new new sorts of things. But yeah, um, yeah. but being able to use all that stuff is is great. I'm not. I, I say that I'm the only person in the studio, but I'm not on my own. I've got a huge support network and I've got a huge team of people who will um, help me out on all those difficult things that um, that really require experts to to do it right. Uh, even even still, even with that support net- network, does it does it feel a bit daunting or, or weird to kind of be on your own at this point after working what? 15 years or so, like you said before, with Fantasy Flight, a super collaborative environment. Mm-hmm. It's different. That's that's for sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, over the years, I had inherited lots of other responsibilities at FFG. So I was also reviewing everybody's games. I was reading most of the rule books and providing notes. And so without all that stuff on my plate, I feel like I've got a lot more time to actually dedicate to these sorts of things that that I didn't have time to dedicate to before. And so that's kind of a refreshing change of pace. So, I mean, I I miss all those guys at FFG. I'm I'm sure I'll be out there to see them soon because they're they're located right next to Asmodee headquarters. And so I'm sure the next time I'm in town, I'll stop by and say hi to everybody and talk to them about stuff. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's not like I have left them for, to, to strike out on my own sure. instead I'm yeah. kind of leading a, a sister company now and we can kind of help each other out in various ways and um, I can watch them from afar and kind of see what they're up to and um, I still get emails from them asking me about stuff and and, and I help them out where I can mm-hmm. so it's it's a it's a transition it's been really fun so far and uh, I'm really excited to see where it goes is there like a, a a drawer of or a file of game ideas you've been collecting over the years that you're yeah. kind of tapping into yep and and it seems like every day i'm adding something new to it so um <laughs> i'm never gonna never gonna get to explore all of it but but anytime that i'm kind of stuck or trying to um figure out what i should do next i just open that up and i say oh yeah this thing here i forgot about that and i'll spend an <laughs> afternoon mocking up a prototype and seeing if it if it works or not yeah, yeah that's great i haven't even designed any games but i've got a file that i, I peek at occasionally or add things nice to like oh yeah i did have that idea once mm-hmm. get something I'm like what does that mean yeah yeah plenty I of those i've got to write out my de- describe things better when i have ideas <laughs> sometimes i'll read a note that i left myself and i'm like i have no idea what that means but it gave me this other interesting idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great so i know you can't talk a lot about uh the game that you have in the works is, is there anything more besides what you said that you can reveal about it um i mean in the press release we, we just said that it's um it's it's very kind of different game that that tells a uh a story in a unique way, but uh, not really ready to share anything more sure. about it. Uh, I think we'll, we'll get there. But yeah, of course. In terms of kind of what I saw around social media and such, uh, everyone is incredibly excited about this announcement. Uh, Good. You know, you've been you've been kind of a staple of the ho- hobby board gaming world for so long, and you know, I remember when I first. Uh, when I first got into board gaming, like you said, Battlestar Galactic was one of my first games. And then I, you know, I saw Fantasy Flight was doing, it, and I was like, "Man, this guy's name is everywhere. It's all over the place." And uh, it's kind of continued that way. And I think among kind of the people I interact with, you know, game reviewers and people discussing games who are kind of really into the hobby, the idea that uh, there'd be a studio that that explicitly is is saying we want to create something new and different and innovative uh, is, is really exciting. Cool. Yeah, well, I, th- there seems to be this kind of progression as people get into board games. And at some point they're like, just give me a weird game. I want something really off the wall. <laughs> and and I, I think I'm at that point right now where I want, 
I just got into 18xx games and I'm I'm finding more odd war games and such. It's like, man, I, w- I just want something <laughs> really weird. <laughs> I think I think that's the biggest challenge that I'm going to have at the beginning is that like I'll be reading the stuff that I'm working on and I'll be thinking to myself, is that weird enough? And <laughs> I think that there's the danger of going too far too. And so I'm also trying to use restraint where I'm like, okay, but remember Corey, there's like these 12 other crazy things that this game's doing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. And so there's, there's going to be the danger of expectations with the first game where it's like, I've kind of said that like, whatever I'm doing is going to blow your mind, but who knows if it will. Right. I think that it's cool. And I think it's unexpected, but (laughs) <laughs> it's it's not like I've invented a new color that nobody's oh, ever sure. seen before. Well, and like I said before, whenever someone is saying I want to try something new, like there's there's the assumption that you know certain things just aren't going to work sometimes, and uh, I'm I'm perfectly fine accepting games ne- that don't necessarily work when I also get games that are new and interesting and do something unexpected to use the sure the parlance. <laughs> I'm also hoping to like I've got these big ambitious ideas, but I've also got like some smaller, like weirder things, and I'm hoping to do some of those too. Um, mm-hmm. Because I mean, recently I've done nothing but giant sixty to eighty to hundred dollar games for like the last I don't know eight years, and so it would be nice to be able to put out some of these smaller, like fifteen twenty dollar game ideas that i had and um that are also i think different and provide something unique um but they're they're a good change of pace for me because i don't want everything i work on to take me an entire year to put out yeah yeah do in terms of kind of your approach now to designing games is it still you know with fantasy flight the big thing is always fantasy flight always seems to be trying to tell a story they're trying to capture uh something big and epic and, and story tell. Um, is that something that kind of you naturally align with um, that no matter what you're doing, you're trying to, you're trying to tell stories or are you looking to branch off into uh, other directions? Maybe. Um, I think I'm naturally drawn to games that tell stories. It doesn't mean that they have to have tons of flavor text in them necessarily but at least games where the theme and the mechanics reinforce each other. I think like, for example, if I were to do a smaller, like $20 card game, like I I imagine that like the focus of that game would probably not be to tell a story because it's a small $20 game. Sure, Um, Sure. But I would still want it to have a strong theme and I would still want the, um, whatever the, story is of that game to also be important and and part of it for the most part i mean unless there's some wacky game i come up with that's like oh no the whole point of this game is that there's no story um (laughs) it's just numbers and shapes i I don't see myself doing that necessarily i don't see myself making euro games for example but who knows maybe i could do a party game or something that could happen yeah yeah does it feel freeing at this point that kind of anything's possible? Yeah. I mean, you do. I've been doing a certain style of games for over a decade. And so um, being able to branch out a little bit, um, I, I feel like it's it's a good freeing change of pace. Well, I know I'm super excited about it. And I hope uh, it inspires other people to maybe try to do something uh, new or or. or branch out in in ways they haven't necessarily thought of i think uh, that's always going to be good for games um i love to see those stuff i haven't seen before so uh thanks for coming on the podcast uh yeah of course mark a great discussion i'm I'm glad i was able to talk with you and again I'm, i'm really excited to see where unexpected games goes great well thanks for having me on and let me blab about my stuff um and uh i wish you the best thank you and uh Hopefully we'll see some more information as that is released for the game that you are working on. You said the latter half of 2020? Yeah, it'll be probably the second half of the year. Awesome. Uh, Thanks again. Uh, Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com for game reviews and all kinds of other uh, articles and podcasts and such. Uh, Don't forget to rate and review the podcast 
on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. And if you would like to support us and get access to the live stream of our main podcast recordings, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, thanks again, Corey. And uh, good night. Have a good night. Bye.